I'm Flora Lichtman, and you're listening to Science Friday. Today in the show, checking in on the Webb Space Telescope, which has been out there low-key, answering little questions like, what's the universe made of? And posing new ones like, was Einstein wrong? Before launching Webb, every other scientist you would ask, they would be excited about the surprises, and it's given us many. And here to field your questions is Macarena Garcia Marin. She is an astrophysicist and instrumental and instrument scientist at the European Space Agency. She's also also deputy project scientist at the Webb Space Telescope, based at the Space Telescope Science Institute, famously in Maryland. Welcome to Science Friday. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about this because there's so many really interesting things going on. So much exciting news. Let's start with the news this week of this super old galaxy, right? Yes. I mean, this is. To me, it was mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing It was mind-blowing to me, yes. Tell me why that is. <laughs> because we're talking about galaxies that existed about 280 million years after the Big Bang. That's nothing. So they they just, It's like a baby galaxy. It's like a baby so galaxy. So they discovered this galaxy going yes. way back in time. Way back in time. And let's remember the universe is about 13.8 billion years with a B. So this is a baby galaxy. And for a baby galaxy, it has had the time to actually have stars and reaching the galaxy and producing some additional chemical elements on top right. of hydrogen and helium. So it's really, really a fast way of growing galaxies. How, how old should it be to be to make those things instead of what it is now? What would you expect the age to be? I mean, it depends on when they yeah. start being. So stars, they, they can last depending on their mass. They can last between between millions and billions of years. But we don't really know how these very first stars were. They may have been thousands of times wow. bigger than the sun. So, so that's... So why is your head exploding? <laughs> <laughs> because this is really why we launched the James Webb Space Telescope. The, the, pri the primary science case was to observe these very first galaxies and very first stars. And actually, this is the oldest we have confirmed with a spectra, which is like, like fi the fingerprint or the DNA of the galaxy. So you decompose the light and can really make sure how old that galaxy is. But there are candidates that are based on imaging that are even older. They're and older it, ones. Yeah. They, they are only candidates. They are not confirmed, but because they are only based on imaging. But those galaxies, it, it's very interesting because they have been observed with Webb but using gravitational lensing. So right. that is nature helping us right. by enlarging um, galaxies that are really far away. So these galaxies are fainter, and this, the, the, the researchers, they think that probably um, they are the progenitors of these other galaxies we are seeing that are brighter and slightly closer. So it is mind-blowing. So what, what's the, what, what is it here? Do we have to rewrite the laws of physics, or do we have to rewrite how we think galaxies form? I think we have to rewrite how we think galaxies form yeah. at that time of the universe. Yeah. So the things like the Big Bang, and the, the cosmological uh, theories we have, they still hold. But we need to make adjustments to really understand how the galaxies form. It's like the chicken and everything. Is it first the stars? Is it the black hole? How does this all come together? Do these findings make us rethink anything about our own galaxy? I think what is making us rethink is if you go closer to us, still in a very young universe, we already see galaxies with spiral arms and even with bars. So... To me, that's also a surprise that in such an old universe, we already have those structures that take millions of years and billions of years to take place. So in that sense, yes, it is really making us rethink how long do you need to make those structures. Do you have any any idea on that? <laughs> well, Can you we... give us a little bit of a hint? <laughs> we know, for instance, that bars, at least there is one galaxy that we have seen with Webb that has a bar when the universe was about 2 billion years old. Very early still. Yeah. But these are much earlier, right? These galaxies. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, yeah. the first one we're talking about, they are really babies. They are bold and bright, yeah. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to V in Ventura, California. Hi, V. Hi. Um, I'm on Science Friday. You're on Science Friday. Go ahead. Awesome. Yes, I had a question. As of recently, the James Webb Telescope found that there was kind of a void around our Milky Way galaxy. 
I was wondering if you had any sort of insight into this, if maybe it's a possible black hole that we're going towards, or if it's maybe some sort of dark matter we don't know about. A void around our Milky Way galaxy. Have you heard anything about this? Honestly, not. But you've mentioned the black, you've mentioned black holes and you've mentioned yes. uh, dark matter. So in both areas, Webb is also contributing. At the center of our own galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole millions and millions of, 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 of mass in there and with the stars circling around, the material circling around. So we're looking into that with Webb, not only the uh, surrounding of the black hole, but all the structures around it and how that impacts the environment. And when it comes to dark matter, we are also seeing via things like gravitational lensing, how mm -hmm. does the... Ma so gravitational lensing is a situation where you have, for instance, a cluster of galaxies that are really, really massive. They are so big and so massive that they bend the light right. around. Yeah. So when you do the calculations, you find out that there is actually mass missing. So that means there is something like dark matter that you wouldn't see, but you know it's there because it affects the light. So in that sense, yes. Do you think that dark matter has anything to do with the formation of these mystery galaxies that you've just discovered? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> this is one of Ira's favorite topics. <laughs> I love that, yeah. Well, the truth well, is that there are many things we still don't understand, which I'm is I'm glad exciting. to hear you say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people think science knows everything. No, we don't. Right? No. But that's a good thing. <laughs> yes. Because that means that we still have many, many questions that need to be answered. So we need more data and more generations of scientists really looking into this. I've had, and I've had, when we've talked about this before, I've had scientists say, you know, I like the chase more than yeah, the discovery. Exactly. The chase is great. <laughs> and actually, before launching Web, if you were, every other scientist you would ask, they would be excited about the surprises, and it's given us many. What are you chasing? Me, personally? Mm -hmm. I've been chasing, following up with, with the, um, uh, what she was asking, uh, the center of our own galaxy, actually. I, we got data very recently on some structures around the black hole, so I'm very excited looking into that. And are also, they interesting? What what's what are you finding? They about are them? well. We're still looking at the data, so mm. we'll see about that. <laughs> All right, let's go to the phone. San Antonio Tali in San Antonio. Hi, welcome to Science Friday. Hi, thanks so much for taking my call. Go ahead. Um, my question is: I'm not sure if this was an active decision that was made, but how was it decided what direction the telescope was sent in in space? How was how was that trajectory decided? Wow. Oh, yeah, and what direction to find these? Galaxy. You mean in which direction to find the galaxy? Oh, it's a really good question. So first you go to the galaxies you already know they are there. And for that we have um, what we call deep fields. For instance, the Hubble Space Telescope looked into these deep fields and we knew there were galaxies that were perhaps about 400 million years old after the Big Bang. So you look into the fields, you already have data, and you just observe during maybe 10 hours, and then you compare uh, those images and do some tests to really understand if there are galaxies. And once you have candidates, then you go back and take a spectra. That is, you make a rainbow of that candidate. But yeah, the, the fields were fields that were already observed by telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. It feels like we cannot talk about Webb without talking about exoplanets. I agree. <laughs> what, is, <laughs> what is new and exciting there to you? New... Uh, everything, Webb has opened up the field of exoplanets, which is great because exoplanets didn't even exist when Webb was conceived. I mean, really? we didn't see them. We didn't, yeah, we hadn't they seen them. They might have been there. Sorry, they were there, you're <laughs> right. But, but as a science topic, quote unquote, we didn't know they were there. And now there are almost 6,000 of them. So yes, it's a field that is really blossoming. Lots of discoveries, lots of new molecules, observations of day side and night side. So it's really, really exciting. And it's opening up a new field. Well, there was this recent news that I think was linked to Webb about a biosignature. Correct. On an exoplanet. Yes. Burst our bubble or tell us what the real deal is. Oh, the real deal is that uh, that's a very bold claim, <laughs> right? So uh, extraordinary it, claims, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. So, of course, when that news came out, uh, there was a lot of excitement, but then other scientists from the community um, actually look at the data and they're concluding different things. So to confirm that claim, you would have to confirm the type of planet that it is. And still, it's not clear if mm. it's something like a mini Neptune right. or a Haitian world that is a world that is water with a very 
uh, with a hydrogen atmosphere. So we don't know the type of planet. Still not clear if the detection is solid. And still not clear if those if the molecules that are claimed are actually the ones they are because they could be something else. And the third thing is that even if, if all the other conditions um, are, are demonstrated, DMS, which is this molecule, um, you can also find yeah. it in comets and you can also find it in the interstellar medium. So many open questions. When you get up in the morning, what gets you excited about what you do? Everything, to be honest. I have yeah. to say, every day there is some new scientific discovery. Every day there may be a new paper. Every day there is something that, you know, the community is excited about. And then part of the work is also to bring that message to the public. Well, it's not just about the science community. That's what you're here for. That's exactly. why we got you. Coming up after the break, we'll talk about what to expect from a possible successor to the web. Stay with us. Hey, Ira here. You've probably heard me say many times that we are all in this together. We're so encouraged by those who have backed me up on this by stepping up to support Science Friday in the face of the current funding challenges. So thank you to everyone who has donated in the past month. It's clear that many of you value science and count on public media as we do. You are the driving force behind our work. Your support strengthens Science Friday, provides stability in these moments of volatility, and your support is more crucial now than ever. So if you haven't made a donation to help close the current funding gap, you can still make an impact by going to sciencefriday.com slash donate. Any amount you can give helps to sustain Science Friday programming in this critical moment. Again, that's sciencefriday.com slash donate. And thanks. And let's go to the phones. Aaron in New Orleans. Hi, Aaron. Yes, hi. Thanks so much for taking my call. Um, I, I did have a question. You know, I, do, I, I actually changed it to a much better one, if that's okay. We'll, we'll be the, we'll be the ask, judge of that. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. What I wanted to, to, to ask the guest was, was that what is her opinion on the Amuamua object? Do you think that this was something from intelligent life Ooh, or do you think this was just some blip uh, from from another solar si system that just happened in, into ours glad you changed your question that was a good one yes i yeah that's a really good question personally i think it was a quote unquote object or visitor from outside of our solar system as we were saying before the claim of life or intelligence or anything like that it requires really lots of proof, and mm. we don't have that. But his, yeah, it's... Yeah. His original question, which I had, was whether the budget cuts are affecting your research and the research of astronomy and NASA and, and, and all the stuff that you do. So at this point, we don't know, and that's a question better addressed to NASA mm -hmm. in terms of what's But you don't happen. feel it yourself at this point? At this point, no. What, no. what I feel and what I, I can really say is that the observatory is performing incredibly. The community is exciting and the science coming out of it, it's really something worth pursuing every single day. You know, I think for the public and for someone like me, a lot of what I see from Webb are these beautiful images and they bring me so much joy and so much pleasure. But I wondered for you, for astrophysicists, like, do you learn something by looking at the images or is it really just the data that underpins it that you're interested in? We learn a lot from images. And actually, often you first use the image to identify candidates of special galaxies or candidates of something, and then you take a spectra. Because with imaging, you have much bigger um, field of view. You cover lots of space. But also the different colors you use to create these beautiful images. It's a thing of, in, in the visible, would be red and blue and green and all that. So you have infrared colors. These colors give you a lot of information. And all of these beautiful images you see, they are also used to the science with them. Mm. So is it like a Where's Waldo where you're like, oh, look, there's something in the corner that looks interesting. Let's yeah. follow up. It is. <laughs> are, are, it is. Are, are people better at looking at the images than, let's say, AI? I mean, if you got a bunch of people together I to think, find stuff? I think there is a bit of both. I think uh, the future of astronomy, uh, I mean, the future of many missions is to have large 
vast amounts of data. Right. So there's going to be a, some sort of machine learning techniques that can be applied for that. But behind that, I think, personally, you always need a person with a brain that can do the interpretation and, and actually the figuring out exactly what's going on. And, and, the, and the web was specifically made to make these kinds of discoveries, right? What yeah. tools does it have to do that? It has four science instruments. They all operate on the infrared. So that's a type of light we don't see, but it's really, really good to see cold objects and to peer through the dust and to see very distant objects. And we have about 75% of the time with your spectroscopy. Right. So all of the four instruments have a spectroscopic modes. We have a vast array of spectroscopy, and that means essentially we break up the light into a rainbow. And with that, you can really understand what's going on. And they, where they also do imaging. We do uh, coronography, which is a technique where you can block the light from a star, for instance, and see the planets around. Wow. Yeah, you it's need to direct, do that. You yeah. do that as well, exactly. Yeah. So we do yeah. have a lot of scientific power behind all of the instruments. Well, what's happening? I know already we're talking about a successor to the web. Right, the the Roman Space Telescope. How would that be different from the Webb Telescope? And what would it do differently? Roman will be different because it will look into a different wavelength, and also it's a different concept. For, it, Roman will do lots of surveys, really large field of view, covering large portions of the sky. And what do you learn by doing that? Well, you can. There's going to be a lot of learning on um, transients. That is, a transient is that you go to a region of the sky and observe it, and then you go back again and look for things that have changed. Mm. And that could be supernova, that could be galactic nuclei, for, um, black holes active, right. etc. I see you're not excited at all about this <laughs> kind of work. I, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Macarena Garcia Marin is an astrophysicist and instrumental scientist for the European Space Agency, also deputy project scientist for the Webb Space Telescope. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate and review us if you like the show. Um, and you can always leave us a comment on this segment on Spotify. We'd love to hear from you. Today's episode was produced by Aneth Heist. But a lot of folks help make this show happen every single week, including... John Dankowski. Danielle Johnson. Beth Ramey. Jackie Hirschfeld. I'm Flora Lichtman. Thanks for listening. <laughs>